My name is Michelle Neal. Thank you for joining us for SITSAI Oz Online. I am the Secretary and Social Media Moderator for the Australian Citizen Science Association. And we're joined today by Mark Smith from Nerd Excel and the Social Media Research Foundation. Over to you, Mark. All right. Well, thanks for having me here this evening. Hi, I'm Mark Smith. I'm a sociologist. I'm in California, and I work on the Node Excel project at the Social Media Research Foundation. And we'll talk about uh, networks, social networks, and social media networks, and how to get insights into them with no software development, no programming skills, uh, using a add-in for Excel called Node Excel. Uh, we are a not-for-profit organization in California and around the world. We have members who are computer scientists and information scientists and social scientists. And our aspiration is to make it a lot easier to think about uh, collections of connections, to think about networks, to think about social networks and social media networks and we produce this tool called uh, Node Excel and Node Excel is this um, add in for Excel. There, there's Excel and using uh, Node Excel you can um, pretty quickly uh, get a, a collection of connections, a network from places like Twitter or Flickr or wikis or YouTube or blogs. And these networks turn out to be relatively useful or insightful. Um, essentially, we are trying to answer the question, what does a hashtag look like? Uh, what does a discussion group look like? What does a collection of wiki pages look like in the sense that they have social structure and shape? And so our application, here it is, this is Node Excel. Uh, Node Excel gives you a new menu in Excel. And there's our menu. And this menu enables you to get data from a variety of sources, analyze it, visualize it, and then publish it to a variety of endpoints, uh, to the web to our website called the Node Excel Graph Gallery. So you can see that we can get you Flickr data and Twitter data and YouTube data and there's Wiki data and also data from other network importers. And when you bring in this data into Node Excel, you often end up with a map and a report uh, that might look like this. And this is a map uh, from a couple of days ago of SITSAI Oz Online. And so October 16th, 2020, we went out to Twitter and we collected uh, data about uh, 460 tweets. And these messages um, sometimes contained the name of, two, you know, one person tweeted the name of, of another person. They replied to that person or they said something about that person, they mentioned that person, or in some cases they retweeted them. And when that happens, we draw a line between two people. So if I retweet you, I draw a line from me to you. And if you reply back to me, we draw a line from you to me. And what we can see is that um, there are a lot of lines but not everybody has the same number of lines. And in fact, uh, most people only have a single line coming from them to someone else. And there's a relatively small number of people for whom most of the lines come to them. And so this is known as preferential attachment. And you may know it as the Matthew effect. Uh, un unto those who have much, more will be given. Uh, otherwise known as the rich will uh, get, get richer. That's how that goes. But, uh, so what this report will show us is if we analyze that web of connections, who's most in the middle of it? And middleness is something that we can actually calculate as uh, something called centrality. And we use a metric called betweenness centrality. And so these are the 10 people out of, in this case, there were 40 or some, uh, 91, I'm sorry, 91 people are in this image or 91 user accounts. And if we look through those user accounts, we find that these are the 10 that are most in the middle of the conversation. 
and this middleness or centrality, in this case, betweenness centrality, is different from follower account. So they're not in the order of their follower accounts. They're in the order of how much they sit in the center, like this account or this account, and very much unlike this account. This account is not very central at all, but some of these accounts are far, far more central. And so being in the middle is a sociological indicator of your social importance. And so this is the rank ordered list of the people based on that social importance metric. Uh, we then have this sidebar that appears, which then tells you about the content shared within this discussion. And that means things like the top URLs or for that matter, maybe the top hashtag. So citizen science, not a parrot, disaster response, sit side resilient, South Australia, threatened species, hungry parrot, parrots, something about parrots was very important. Um, but I'll note that um, if, you, if you look through here, uh, each of the groups was not talking about things with an equal amount of focus. So for example, G3 does not talk about fire at all. G4 doesn't talk about fire, but uh, I'm in California, so I have a certain affinity for your issues with fires. We, we know something about fire here too. Uh, but bushfires show up in group one and group two, but not in group three and not in group four. And so each of the groups may in fact be talking about slightly different things. And if you zoom into our maps, we put the summary words, the words that define each group as labels at the top of each group. And so SITSI Oz Online is one topic of possible interest, but if we broaden our focus to SITSI more broadly, we can search the Node Excel graph gallery and we may find a wide variety of other uh, topics that involve the concept of sit sit citizen science. And so some of these are other slices of time for sit Oz online, but it's also the word sit and the larger term citizen science. And so here's citizen science and here's sit sci, and they look kind of similar and we could compare them. Uh, we could look at them going back in time. And so we might want to know what fraction of the larger citizen science discussion does citizen science on, Oz online occupy. And if we scroll down here, we will see that the answer is pretty highly you're number two in sit sci worldwide. That's pretty impressive. Um, these are the links that are related to this discussion. This is the sit sci uh, discussion from about a week ago. So this is going back about 100 days starting in October. So it's about three or four months of data. Uh, and this reveals sort of the shape of the global conversation about citizen science and it reveals your position within that global conversation and that, that's pretty impressive. So what we've recently done is taken this data and I, I should note that if you go to the end of the page uh, there is the data itself as a node excel workbook which is to say as a spreadsheet and here it is as graph ml as xml that gets imported into other applications and then there's this link, which is the recipe used to analyze the data. And that's something that uh, Node Excel lets you do. It has this feature where you go and import options. And when you import the options, it sets up all the configuration of Node Excel so that if you hit automate, uh, all of these buttons are already configured. You just hit run and it does what it's supposed to do. So we could, for example, uh, type in something like, um, how about SCO, MO, and uh, warming? And we'll see what is the discussion. There's not that much of it, uh, in which people are tweeting the name, uh, well, the, the uh, slang term for your prime minister and the term warming. And we'll see that very shortly. So we've just gone out to data, uh, to Twitter, and grabbed a bunch of data, and then pulled it in 
uh, and we'll see that appear in the analysis pretty shortly. Uh, we also do this in this other format though, uh, which is to use the power of this new product from Microsoft, uh, not that new, about five years old now, called Power BI, Power Business Intelligence from Microsoft. And what Power BI lets us do is deliver the data that we were just showing you in a very static way, we can now deliver it to you in a much more dynamic way where you are able to look at different dimensions of the data, like, uh, uh, well, which languages are being used or which kinds of devices are being used to tweet or whether or not somebody is using positive or negative words. But, um, Using Power BI lets our users sort of click their way through uh, the analysis of the data in a way that really reveals who, who's on top, what topics are the most salient, uh, whether or not different groups are in some ways distinct from one another, uh, which is very interesting when we're talking about political discussions or polarized discussions where there's difference of opinion about what is real. So. These uh, reports, we hope, act as a useful guide to the discussions that matter to your organizations and allow us to also look at things like, oh, you know, more contentious discussions, let's say like the anti-vaccine movement or um, people's disputing the, the efficacy of using masks to slow down COVID those kinds of discussions really get visualized in this way and it reveals who the key thought leaders, the influencers are on a variety of topics. And so that could be a useful tool when uh, science communicators are trying to deliver accurate information, scientifically valid information in an otherwise, well, noisy information environment. Um, I was just gonna ask, if you want to do a demo of one, a very, very typical one here in Australia is Wild Oz. D could you spell that? W-I-L-D-O-Z. One word. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Let's do it. Okay. So here I am just firing up uh, Node Excel. So it pops up. It says, here I am. And uh, we, we do a little clicking and we're going to get, uh, this is the graph pane. And that's where we're going to put our graph. And over here is the Node Excel menu. And I'm gonna point into the import menu and select Twitter search, W-I-L-D-O-Z, like that? Yes, that's right. Uh, so there you go. We're now at 11, 12, 13 pages. Each page is 100 tweets. So we're at 1,700, 1,800 tweets. We can't really go past 180 pages or 18,000 tweets. And why is that? Well, those are Twitter's rules. Twitter will not give us information beyond uh, 18,000 tweets or seven or eight days, whichever comes first. And so they really limit our view to sort of the recent. Uh, but one solution to that is to, well, just keep going back. You can go back every day, you can come back every hour um, and keep asking for data. And if you do that, you can patch together a reasonable longitudinal study. As, as you saw back here, uh, we've got Citizen Science and SITSI Oz Online going back uh, for quite a while. And so that allows us to gain a kind of uh, longitudinal view that reveals changes over time. In what way was, let's say, SITSI different, um, you know, even just a year or two ago, we have data in here that goes back quite a ways and we might be able to find out what your organization or other discussions look like in previ previous time slices. And when we do that, we might be finding out who are the leaders who may have left or new leaders have emerged and that kind of a thing. So if you visit Node Excel Graph Gallery on a regular basis, you'll see a a uh, pretty regular changing stream of maps and reports on a variety of topics. Uh, there was Canadian politics, CBN Poly, 
and I'm pretty sure we also do you guys. I have an OS Paul here somewhere, um, right here. Right, so the data has now been downloaded and it's going through the beginning of the automation process. So we downloaded about 3,600 tweets for Wild Oz. And now Node Excel is going to go through the second step, which is analyzing that information. So it takes those uh, 3,600 tweets and it reads each one. And it asks the question, is anybody mentioned in this tweet? Is there, any, is there a username in the reply position? Is there a retweet going on? And if it finds that, it builds what we call an edge, a connection. And so a single tweet could conceivably be uh, as many as 15 connections. But why 15? Because you can't squeeze that many names into a tweet. There's only like 240 characters. So uh, there is an upper limit on how many people you can mention in a tweet. But a single tweet could be a retweet a reply, a mention, it could be more than one thing. It can mention more than one person. You can only reply to one person because reply means being the first person listed in the tweet. So there's only one first person position. But each of these tweets could conceivably encode one or more connections between users. And so what we're now doing is looking at all the different ways you can count up things about the web of connections that emerge from those 3,600 tweets. And some of those things you can count are things like, well, how many connections? How many other people are you connected to? And then for that matter, and we'll call that out degree, how many people are you connected to? But we might also ask the question, how many people connect to you? That's an interesting question. What's the ratio? And how many of the people that connect to you do you connect back to? That's a reciprocation rate. And how many of the people who you connect to connect back to you? And so the amount of reciprocation matters, the amount of connectivity matters. And so as we calculate all these different metrics, we end up with a pretty compelling picture of who's who. Who are the key people and what are the groups? Who are the influencers and what are the divisions? And in each division, what are the characteristic words, hashtags, URLs um, that define being that person, that group, or that graph? And so by doing that, we think of this as a kind of an espresso shot of social media that it makes it possible to consume a large amount of social media without overwhelming the human capacity to actually read messages. And so if you could read a tweet, uh, let's see, in one minute, how many tweets could you possibly read? 10 tweets a minute? Well, let's just say 10 tweets a minute. So that's, uh, 600 tweets an hour, I think. And then maybe you could read tweets for three or four hours a day. So that's maybe somewhere between two and 3,000 tweets per hour an analyst could conceivably consume. But Node Excel just consumed 3,600 tweets. And while we went off and had a cup of tea, we could come back and have Node Excel tell us, sort of like, more like an espresso shot, who are the key people? What are the divisions in the groups? What are they talking about? In other words, everything that we might actually derive from the experience of reading 3,600 tweets, it might do for us. And then lead us to reading only the 50 or 60 tweets that really, really matter. Because the rest might be retweets, the rest might be just you know spam and nothing, and we really might only want to pay attention to the tiny minority of content that got the majority of the attention or the activity of other people in the network. And so, by using network concepts, 
we can leverage the structure of social media to help us identify the shape of social media. And we did some of this work with a collaborator. Uh, if I point you at Pew Research, that's P-E-W, research.org. Uh, there's an article called Mapping Twitter Topic Networks from Polarized Crowds to Community Clusters, and there it is. Uh, and, and this article, uh, and there's a lot of it, there's like lots and lots of pages in this article, but there is really just this one image at the bottom of page one, figure three here, which I feel summarizes the entire article in one image. And this image illustrates the six basic network structures that we observe when we make network maps of Twitter. And I should note, we do think that some of these structures appear in similar kinds of social media, like email, discussion groups, but it does not appear in other kinds of social media that are not similar, like wikis or let's say YouTube, but or uh, certain parts of YouTube, the video video network, not the conversation network. And so conversations as defined as the ability to reply to somebody generate networks that look like these. And these six networks are in essence not reducible to each other. Uh, and they are the divided network, the unified network, the fragmented network, the clustered network, and the in and the out hub and spoke network. And if we go back here, this starts to make more sense, I think, once you've seen that image. You start going, oh, hub and spoke, hub and spoke, that's hub and spoke. And oh, fragmented, these are the brand clusters. These are rows and columns of people. They didn't talk to anybody and nobody talked to them. These are isolates, the, the people that don't get interacted with. And look, uh, phrases like marketing research have lots of people who said the word marketing research, but they didn't have a conversation. Whereas over here, something like IIoT big data, there is no big brand cluster. And what, by the way, IIoT is uh, the industrial internet of things. So that's a hashtag. There's IOT, the internet of things. And then there's IIoT, because you know your hashtags have to keep growing, otherwise people catch up with them. You know, big data is not enough anymore. Now it has to be, you know, deep learning or something like that. But so compare how different marketing research is from IIoT big data. There are one, two, three, four, five, six, maybe seven big thought leaders in IIoT big data. It is not a brand in the sense that people casually mention it without talking to each other. They only talk to each other about it. And they really don't talk to each other. They retweet mentions of it by these seven or so thought leaders. And that's very different from this shape, where hundreds of people mention marketing research without ever getting a mention from anybody else. And then there are a few dozen of these smaller clusters. So very different kind of crowd shape between these two different kinds of discussions. And so when we go and look at your conversations, we ask the question, which of these shapes are you? And then we ask another question, which did you want to be? Because they're not all the same. Now, it's not that some are good and some are bad. It's just that some are better than others for some purposes. And so if you're trying to grow community, but you always get this pattern, maybe that's not working. And if you want to achieve public awareness, but you only get this pattern, maybe that's not working either. So these different shapes tell us something about the way that messages propagate through social media and different kinds of messages propagate in different ways. And so, for example, this shape is the shape of politics. Down here, you can see political discussions tend to be, at least in the United States, uh, we're you know two groups of people who don't like each other, 
And so in the United States, we have two political parties, a right wing party and a far right wing party. And so those two groups don't like each other because they can't agree on how far right they could get. And so when you see this pattern, you know that those are two groups, large groups of people, and they're not talking to each other, but they're talking about the same thing. So they must not like each other. And indeed, this division or polarization pattern is an illustration of divisive discussion topics, whereas this pattern is what a community looks like. Everybody's talking to everybody. And so we could now perhaps go look at any second now, your data set will complete and we'll get to look at wild Oz and see what kind of community is it? Who are its leaders? What do they link to? What hashtags are also used? And what words and salience or sentiment is in the language being used by these people? And so in doing that, we hope that uh, while you, know, you, you could be doing something else while Node Excel is doing this, uh, and Node Excel can do this roughly 100 times a day, and there's a really good chance you can't. Right, you, there, there's a limit to how much you as a human being can consume, but with augmentation, with a machine, maybe we could. Maybe we could get to the essence of what there is to know when we know something about a collection of connections. And that's what we'd like to be able to do for users who, particularly the users who aren't software developers, who aren't in a position to just do this all themselves in Python, let's say, or in R. Uh, so our metaphor is along the lines of something like a, um, a, a point and shoot digital camera, where we want you to be able to just take the picture not think about how do I make film? How do I make a lens? Um, in fact, we just want you to think, what would I take a picture of? And there you go, that's in any second now, we're almost done. Uh, we're gonna see the shape of Wild Oz. And if we click up here, we may see that it's already been uploaded to, no, oh, any second now should be uploaded to the graph gallery. And so this is a way of communicating information about these insights into collections of connections. And I should note that these connections that we're looking at are from social media, they're, they're from the internet. All that network theory is, is the mathematical analysis of collections of those answers. Who did what, with whom, where and when, and if we can encode the answer to that as a single row in a database, in a spreadsheet, what we end up with is something like this. Uh, here, I'll switch us to the edges worksheet. We're gonna see this here. These are edges and this is wild Oz. And so that took us maybe eight, 10 minutes. It happened while we were doing other things. And what we're seeing here is the collection of connections. It's uh, this person did something with this other person. And that's usually in the form of a tweet that happened at a time and it had a certain text and there it is, it keeps jumping around. And so there's a user and they had a relationship with another user. And this generates it doesn't want to stay put. Uh, it, it generates this web. And the web is subject to analysis. You can actually see shape in that web. And I see the shape of broadcast. There's a broadcast. There's a broadcast. There's a broadcast. There's a broadcast. To a certain extent, this is a little bit, a little bit of a community but there really is not a lot of community in Wild Oz. And maybe we can see it here now, I think. Uh, one, two, three, yep, there it is. It's been uploaded to the Node Excel Graph Gallery, so you can go and load that from the web yourself. And what it shows us is, uh, this is 2,300 Twitter users. 
It's a week in the life of Wild Oz. There were a total number of, um, let's see, Unique Edge is 3,951 connections among people. There were 300 tweets. And these are the people who are the most influential people talking about Wild Oz. I wish you all a happy Parrot Day. I guess we give each other crackers on that day. <laughs> no, it's Parrot of the Day. Oh, Parrot of the Day. I'm sorry. I see you have so many parrots. Every day is Parrot Day. Every day it is was, Parrot Day. Every day is Parrot Day. I thought it was like a particular day of the year. It's Parrot Day. And that we would all give each other crackers on that day. Um, no, but maybe we should ask Parrot of the Day to make that day. That would be awesome. There you go. It would be Parrot Day. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so these people are the people who, when we look at this graph and we go, well, who are the people, those little fly specks at the center? We want to zoom in. We want to see those people. Sometimes it's difficult. At, it is possible to do that. We have this interactive version of the graph. We allow you to click on that as an alternative. It does take a little longer to load that, but once it's loaded, it does let you zoom in and see who is this person. And, and so we can kind of zoom in on the graph. And when you tooltip, you get to see who is that person and what was their last tweet. And we can do this with these other hub and spoke patterns. We'll see. It's really just the you know one person in the center there, and then all of these people are essentially retweeting the person. And so when you look at diagrams like this, it does raise a sociological question, which is just how social is social media? And the answer is not very. If by social we mean things like community, reciprocity, density, interactivity, these things are mostly absent in a lot of social media. And in many cases, it is a mistake to make a claim for the thing that you should demonstrate. We should show that social media is social, not assume it is. And you know, we do this a lot. We assume that online communities had communities in them. And that was a presumption too that bared evaluation and turned out not to be very true. How much community is on, in an online community? And the answer is not much. Which isn't to say it can't happen. It's just that it is relatively rare. It is not the rule, it is the exception. And when you find it, that's a magic thing. But in order for you to find it, it would have to have a certain kind of network structure. It would have to be a dense web of interconnections. It can't just be a hub and spoke because that's what we see here. And hub and spoke is celebrity. It's broadcast. It's not a bad thing. It's just not community. And it's not really social either. So social media really means maybe amateur media or you know, not institutionalized media, but it doesn't necessarily mean the kind of place where people actually interact with each other in ways that resemble quote unquote social interaction. Because social, I, I'm a sociologist, I think I get to have a professional opinion about what constitutes social. I'm going to assume that reciprocity matters and that the density of reciprocity matters. Like how many people trade stuff with each other? Like I gave you a ride to the airport. You picked up my kids at school. I got some groceries for you. That's reciprocity. But you speak, I retweet you. That's not reciprocity because what do you ever do for me? You know, it never comes back. That's celebrity. That's a very asymmetric pattern of interaction. And it's not necessarily a bad thing. Celebrity exists, but the amount that you think about the celebrity is inversely proportionate to the amount the celebrity talks, thinks about you, right? Because whoever you love most who is a celebrity, they don't know about you at all. So it's a very asymmetric relationship. Doesn't mean it's a bad one, just means it's asymmetric. 
Well, that's what we see in social media. It's the asocial media, <laughs> if you will, because social suggests a kind of symmetry. And what you're seeing here on the screen is a very asymmetric thing in which a less than 1% of the population seem to essentially drive the entirety of the conversation. 99% of the people who create content in this environment never get replied to. They're the people out here, right? They replied to this person, they retweeted this person, they liked it, they favorited it, they mentioned it, but nobody talked to them, like ever. <laughs> And so that's not very social. Now, that doesn't mean that it's not a valuable form of media because like the radio is not very social. TV is not very social. Even the newspaper is not very social, but it's still media and it still has value. It's just as a sociologist, I kind of want to argue, let's not presume the things that we should demonstrate. And just because we named it social media doesn't mean it is. And I love that idea too, but I'm wondering if with this Nerd Excel, could you eventually do this for say a handle? Oh yeah, absolutely. Give me a handle. Okay. We'll do it for you right now. Sit say Oz. Yeah, got it. We'll do it. So I'm just wondering, cause we, we use this, or our social media team use this for looking at who is it, who in the zoo, who is in our circle, who, are, who should we also be talking to and who can we bring into our circle? So again, we're, we're trying to create community here. Right, right. And, and, and it's a challenging uh, task and it's not impossible, but it, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen because people make the effort to do so, not because it's just really easy. So sit, sigh, Oz, there we go. And here we go. So this is gonna be the collection of tweets over the last seven or eight days from your account. And it's also all mentions of you from other accounts. So this is a, a very similar to going to the Twitter search interface, typing in that string, and then going back uh, as many pages as you could go until you reached about seven or eight days in. Now you as a user on the web can keep going, but we as a piece of, hard, uh, of software cannot because the API behaves differently than the web page. But, these are the terms of use for Twitter. So we're gonna get, in this case, it looks like about 600 sit -si oz tweets. We'll do the analysis of those in just a few minutes. It's, it'll all happen kind of automatically. But you could also come back here and you'll see that if we type in sit -si, that you do get a pretty good sense of the other conversations, like sit sci, yes, but science ed. It's a smaller conversation, but it exists. And there's like five or 10 people in there who seem to be getting a little bit of an audience as well. And so maybe the other place to look is science ed. And then it's not just those topics. You also get, I think we're going to find that STEAM, for example, shows up. Uh, oh yeah, and here's a good one, SciCom. So you might ask yourself, well, SciCom, they're like a cousin, right? You know, they're, they're not, you know, they're part of the extended tribe and we might want to have relationships with them. And the question would be, how, how do we most effectively engage the SciCom community? And the answer would be, these are the 10, that's gonna load any second now. Uh, these are the 10 people who are most central in the SciComm community and who probably would be more valuable investment targets for your time because you can't engage them all. And there were quite a few, right? We have here somewhere on the order of 4,000, you know, strike that, 6,846 individual accounts. And that was over a mere three days, three and a half days. It's a lot of accounts. It's a lot of tweets. It's a lot of retweets. There's a lot of content there. And so instead of trying to keep up with SciComm, it kind of seems like it's outside the scope of a human's ability, right? So instead, we'd suggest looking at the SciComm map every three or four days 
and getting a sense of, well, who are the top influencers? And you'll note that we've made it relatively easy to hit the follow button. If we look at this as quote unquote social media, then that means that it's about relationships. And so if you want to propagate your message more effectively, you do so through your connections. And so the question then becomes, well, how do I choose who to connect to? Maybe connecting to the most strategically positioned people is a good way of filtering. Because again, let's go look up at the top here. How many people are there who are like out at the edges here? And are any of these edge people really the people you should invest in? Or is it the case that the people at the center are almost by definition, the people who really are more worthy of your time and attention, your investment. And so we will want to zoom in on just those people. And when you do that, what you're really doing is forming a relationship with them. You're gonna follow them. And you might even want to do something like this smart tweet feature. Okay, so the smart tweet feature is uh, basically we uh, pull out two words and two hashtags from that person's collection of messages that are the most unique to them, the most salient to them. And then we build a tweet, a rough draft of a tweet for you that suggests words that you might mention in a tweet to them. And so by trying to talk to the influencer using words that are salient to them, it's a lot like being introduced to someone and having the host tell you, you're both interested in fishing, you both like surfing, you could talk about that. And so it's an icebreaker, it's a way of building a connection. And so it might be difficult to figure out, well, what does that person really care about? And this feature will help you by saying, oh, well, these are the things that that person cares about most. So using these features, allow the relationship management officer, if you will, the person who is trying to handle building connections proactively to figure out which connections they should build. You know, which are the ones that are most valuable, these people versus, you know, the people at the periphery. And so we're not discriminating based on their followers or even their tweet count, anything like that. It is really about using the wisdom of the crowd to say, who did the other people connect to? Who did the other people identify as valuable? And so here we would talk about the lightning complex. That was the topic that that person was interested in. And here we can see, this is SciComm, you can see how hub and spokey it is. It's a very hub and spoke kind of thing. Um, and so the people at the center of these structures are clearly more relevant than almost anybody else. There's so many people, but only really less than 1% of them are the people who matter the most to this conversation. The, the general recommendation would be you start with a few terms and you kind of snowball sample. And eventually you come up with a portfolio of terms. Maybe there are 15 words related to science, uh, citizen science that matter. Maybe there are certain accounts that matter. You map them, you map them weekly. And you're always then able to identify who are the new mayors, the new leading voices. What topics are the most salient in this time period. And so this allows you to do content marketing. Uh, the Global Investigative Journalism Network uses Node Excel every week to map the hashtag data-driven journalism. And that allows them to gain a kind of week-long overview of again, you know, a, a 3,000 or so person tweet stream a lot of content and that content gets, you know, just too voluminous 
to be able to keep up with as a human being. And instead, we give them a map. You know, they get to see an overview of what it looks like when people have just used that topic, that hashtag for the week. Uh, we are finding what are they talking about and, you know, who are the leading voices. And so GIJN posts our Node Excel map every week uh, because it's an adequate summary of that week in discussion. And that means that you're less likely to actually miss the salient content related to a, a professional discussion. And that's important because professionals are busy. They don't have the time to sit around consuming all the tweets in on data-driven journalism, like an espresso shot or maybe like an aerial photograph, sort of Google Maps for social media. Uh, this is a way of gaining the ability to see a larger territory in a lot less time and a lot less effort. And so there you are, sit si Oz, and what you have are those, those are the, your 10 people, and I guess we could also go over here and you can see it in a slightly uh, easier to consume format in the graph gallery. But there you are, sit si Oz, and there are your 10 people. Those are your topics. And these are your related hashtags. What fraction of biodiversity does your account account for? And is biodiversity the topic that you are going to identify as strategic for your organization? We're, we're going to be in the top 10 of thought leaders in biodiversity. That's our goal. Because being the mayor of your own name, you know, that's not that much of an accomplishment, but figuring out what is it that you, which stakeholders do you want to influence? Who do you want to talk to? And figuring out who are their mayors now and talking to those mayors, because it's not the case that you want, want to be the mayor of every hashtag, because you can't. But it is the case that you would like to have a relationship with the mayor of every hashtag that is relevant to you. Sociology has this idea that we, we as a society, uh, humans, have moved from an older type of society to a newer type of society. We went from Gemeinschaft to Gesellschaft. We went from sort of the mechanical to the organic. We went from the village to the city. That's the not so fancy way to say it. What the internet is doing is bringing us back to the village. How is that? Well, we're suddenly connected to 2 billion people, 3 billion people. That doesn't seem like a village. I understand. But how many people really care about biodiversity? And how many people are the thought leaders of biodiversity? Less than 300. So that's a village. That's a, at best a small town. That's not that many people. If you look at the world this way, the scale of the problem shrinks from we need to impact 30 million people. We have to change their minds about something. Well, you don't have the marketing budget of Coca-Cola, so you're not going to achieve that goal. But if you look at it a different way, you might say those 30 million people are actually turning and looking to maybe 100 different conversations. And those 100 conversations each have 10 leaders. And so there's really only a thousand people. I need to identify and engage and share my message. And if they share my message with their community, I am reaching at least some fraction of that original 30 million. And I'm doing it with relationship energy rather than cash money. Because I don't know about you, but there's not a lot of cash money floating around. And so I, I have time, I have relationship energy, I can make connections, that I can invest in. Buying influencers, buying advertising, buying media, I can't afford that. And so instead, what I want to do is change the world one, what used to be a cup of coffee at a time, it's now a Zoom chat. And if you could have 100 Zoom chats with the right 100 people, 
what would happen at the end of that? And that's what we're trying to do. We're a targeting mechanism to help people identify the right hundred people to have that conversation with. And then to evaluate how well that worked by measuring where are you in your network? Where do you wanna be in your network and helping you figure out how to get there. And so sociology really cares about networks and we hope you will too, because in the same way that geographers probably care about latitude and longitude, and we do too, right? Because if you've ever gone to a city that you don't know and you need to find, you know, where's the airport? How do I get from here to the hotel? Uh, suddenly GPS and latitude and longitude and GIS all matters a lot. But navigating the surface of the planet, it's a good problem to solve, but navigating the social landscape, now that seems really important. Like who do I need to know in this lifetime in order to get done what I'm trying to do. It's interesting to see for us because we use Nerd Excel, as I probably mentioned before, um, to see who's who in the zoo, basically, and to see who's talking about what and to make sure we're following the right people and the right counts and to make sure we don't miss anything that might be of interest to our followers and our community here at home. I have. I must admit, we, we also tend to troll social media, particularly Twitter, to find out what are the new citizen science projects about to start? Where are they starting? What do they need help with? And we've been known to turn around and, and ask them, how do you, how can we help? That's so right. this, this is all about us building our community. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Well, Michelle, thank you so much for spending your time this morning with me. Delighted that you find this interesting. Uh, to, to your viewers or listeners, if anybody's going to watch this in the future, uh, they can reach out to our organization at info, I-N-F-O, info at smrfoundation.org. We're the Social Media Research Foundation. Here we are uh, at smrfoundation.org. Thank you very much for joining us. Good to be here. Thank you.